Oi! Ron O'Connell, Thompson Reuters GFMS, Head of Metals Research and Strategy. Welcome. Thank you. We're going to talk about precious metals today, I mm -hmm. hope. Um, and I want to start talking about things like his history and philosophy of gold rather than the price. Uh, and then we'll get around perhaps to some supply and demand dynamics. But perhaps okay. you could talk a little bit about your background because it's, you know, it's, it's a long and involved background with the precious metals markets. And talk about the, the gold saga would be fantastic. Well, if we kick off with the gold survey, let's do that. Um, it's our 50th anniversary this year. Congratulations. That, Thank that's, you. that's quite something. It might look like it, but I have not been working on it for 50 years. <laughs> Feels like it sometimes. Um, but essentially, the gold survey is pretty hefty tome, uh, lots of words, lots of charts and lots and lots of numbers. And it's been regarded as the Bible of the gold industry for probably something like 35 years, maybe even 40. Yeah because it's all based on primary research. So there's a lot of travel, a lot of talking to individuals right the way through the market from central bankers, through jewelers, to smugglers, to miners, to bankers, to refiners, you name it. And as a result of that, we are able to pull together all the series of numbers that relate to supply, to demand, in all their different guises and trade flows and so on and so forth, with the idea of being able to pull together the supply, demand, balance and structure of the market, which gives us the background and the springboard from which to be able to do the, the sexier analysis, which revolves around investment, frankly. So question, is gold a commodity, is it a currency? I personally think it's both because it's dug up and it's turned into things, but it's also a currency. And by virtue of its role as a currency, when the dollar was on the gold standard, this was the birth of the gold survey. Typically speaking, if you're running a gold mining company or many, any other mine for that matter, and you're working at depth, then the time from discovery of a decent deposit through to coming on stream is anything up to 10 years. Yeah. Dollar gold standard, $35 per ounce, 1934 onwards. 1967, Consolidated Goldfields, which at that point was the world's second largest gold mining company behind Anglo-American, wanted to do decent, sensible 10-year planning. And it was quite clear that the financial structure of the gold market and the dollar market, for that matter, was coming under stress because there was very strong demand from gold from all over the place, but not least because of the Vietnam War, yeah. which was outstripping mine supply by a very considerable margin. And in order to keep the dollar price at $35 per ounce, central banks, but basically the United States, were throwing gold into the market to maintain the price. So. Goldfields thought about this and reckoned that something was going to have to give and it was going to give sooner rather than later. So in an effort to try and identify when the dollar gold link was going to have to be broken and also to try and put some kind of target level on the price, they went into the market, spoke to the key movers and shakers and at that point in particular it was the central banks and came up with their first gold survey which was an in-house document and they concluded that the price was probably going to be severed from the dollar in around about 1972. Right. And in fact, it was 71. A little early, yeah. Um, caused a bit of a furore at the time because everybody who'd been in the market for as long as they were alive was used to $35 gold. And the cool. thought, of, thought of gold going to 80 was anathema to the spirit. Um, but they were proved right. And of course, we've subsequently been up close to 1900 or very nearly 2000 subsequently. When you do the survey and you say you talk to all these people and you've built that trust over 50 years mm -hmm. that people will talk openly uh, and candidly to you yep. to, in order to get such a great picture of the market. Now, whose answers do you trust more, the central bankers or the smugglers? I, I'm just interested because, I, the, because one of them has no reason to obfuscate whatsoever, the smugglers, and the central bankers... Some of them do. Well, well, maybe, but I mean, I think if you get this, this idea of anonymity, then perhaps they're probably a little bit more comfortable with it than central bankers, because that's a much bigger game. The, the central bank part of this equation, it seems to me, is a much bigger game, because they have everything to potentially lose if the gold price is a reflection of the currency they produce. It's not so much a question of judgment, of, of, sorry, of um, trust as interpretation. Right. Because a central banker will not dissemble. If he doesn't want you to know something, he just won't tell you. Right. Um, smugglers probably pretty similar, actually. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's all a question of interpreting flows. Equally, it's partly science, but it's more an art. For example, and I, I first worked on the gold survey when I was a baby analyst back in the early 1980s, you can pick up elements of information which don't square with one another. Mm -hmm. So 
If you're talking about something in the demand sector, let's say it's jewellery or electronics manufacture, for example, and somebody gives you an idea of an expanding market, taken in isolation, and someone else, perhaps in the same country, is talking about a contracting market, you've got to decide whether you're talking about people's market share changing yeah. or whether there's something funny going on and maybe somebody's exporting and so on and so forth. And I remember I was very young and very green and obviously they only trusted me to do a certain amount. So I, I had Northwest Europe as part of my beat. And I remember sitting on a train somewhere in Norway, going frantic, trying to identify where 50 kilos of scrap had gone. <laughs> because it, it was just so complicated, uh, or at least it was for me at that point. So there's all these different elements in the market. And the reason why we are trusted to the extent that we are is because of our continuity. Yeah. And here I have to raise my hat to a gentleman called Tim Green. Um, and without him, I wouldn't have started my career the way I did. He was a journalist originally, and he'd done some work on smuggling and gold had been involved. And he became involved with gold fields in the late 1960s. And he has been a constant right the way through to when he finally retired. He spent years trying to retire and we wouldn't let him. Um, but particularly for people like central banks or Swiss refiners who, by definition, they're the fulcrum of the market. And that's a very, very discreet market. Yes. Uh, so, in order to be able to go in and see these people, the fact that we had Tim with us, keeping those doors open all the way through, was absolutely invaluable. Well, uh, we'll, we'll come on to supply and demand, because I'm, I'm interested in how you see the market at the moment, but, but what I want to start with, really, is the, is the philosophical side of this. And you and I chatted a, bit, a little bit about this mm -hmm. off camera. Because I think um, there's this question in a lot of people's minds, you know, why gold? Why is gold money? It's just another metal. Yeah. Um, and so I think for, for, for the people watching this that perhaps have that question in their minds, and I'm sure there's a lot of them, let's, let's go back, all the way back, and because and, I know you, you love the history side of this. Yeah. Just talk us through why gold and the beginnings and the origins of it as money. Well, it's human nature as much as anything else. There's only two metals which in their elemental form are not white, silver, or gray. One's gold, the other one's copper. Gold is malleable and ductile, as is copper but it's also a noble metal. It doesn't tarnish, it doesn't oxidize, and it's beautiful. Yes. And it was initially discovered pretty much on the surface or in alluvial beds in the rivers in the area known as Nubia, which is now Sudan and southern Egypt. And it's actually mentioned in Genesis. And because it was relatively easy to find, and once you've touched it, you just fall in love with it. Almost by definition, in and of itself, it became a currency. So the old term, by dint of ancient usage, is probably more appropriate for gold than it is for anything else. So going all the way back 3,000 years, it started use as a currency. The price was broadly steady, and then production started to pick up. Gold and silver, incidentally, were pretty much at parity price-wise in those days. Production particularly picked up in the, ooh, what would it have been, the, the, the couple of centuries either side of when we went from BC to AD and particularly over in Europe, and that's tied up with the Romans working westwards, and that was part of the reasons why they did work westwards. And from then on, it stabilised, then it picked up again, and production really expanded in the 19th century. But all the way through, can't, can't say anything about the Dark Ages, because we don't know much, but all the way through that intervening period of history, gold had played a role as a currency. Now, Paul Volcker, I believe it was, made the comment way back 30 odd years or so ago, which has now become something of a truism, which is that it's the only non-fiat currency, i.e. it hasn't got a central bank's chop printed on it, and therefore it's no one else's liability. But that brings us into the professional world. Going back further in time, because it had become accepted as an international currency, people living in areas of risk, whether politically, which was most places in those days, would, would hold it because it was portable and they could take it with them. And I, I've seen wafers of gold, thin as cigarette paper, which people would roll up and put into the hems of Middle Eastern garments if they, if they needed to run for it. Um, equally, there are small bars which you can hide anywhere. And when you're in another country, there you have your currency. It's no coincidence that sailors on the open seas wore gold earrings, because that was what they knew would get them out of trouble if they were washed up somewhere which they didn't like very much. It's funny, you, you said early on in that, where you talk about when you touch gold, you fall in love with it. And I think this is, this is, to me, it's a crucial thing to understand because people that haven't held gold don't understand that 
dynamic. They don't understand that emotional connection that people have to it. And they, they therefore write people off and say, oh, you, fine, you just love gold. You're just, you, you don't think about this clearly. You just love it for whatever reason. And, you know, I was filming recently in a, in a refinery in, in Switzerland. And um, one of the camera guys, he'd never seen gold. He'd never touched gold. And there was $10 million of gold sitting mm. on, a, on a, you know, a trolley no bigger yep. than this. It's just, and it's, you can't help but stare at it. And he said to the guy that was showing us from the front, can, can, I, can I touch it? And the guy said, yeah, sure. So he picked up a little uh, kilo bar. And he beautiful, it to, aren't they? they? They are beautiful. But he handed it to this guy and, and his face, oh, he just went, his mouth just, it just dropped. And he's like, wow. The smoothness, the warmth. Yeah, it's, there's the something texture, about it. The density. Yeah, and, and you kind of, you talk about this stuff and people, I'm sure there's people out there now looking at this going, oh God, here they go. But, you know, <laughs> exactly. But, but, but it's funny because it's, but that connection, it's not just me and you and the other guys and the, and the camera guy. This goes back thousands and thousands of years. So the argument about why is gold money, it's, it's redundant. It doesn't matter. It just is. And there's nothing you can do to That's change that. Absolutely now. right. Yeah. So you kind of need to move past that and just talk about it as a currency, an inflation hedge, whatever, whatever it is to you. Um, and there are different people who look at it as different ways. So, so when you talk about the different ways it's viewed, how do you think of it? Do you think of it as a currency first and foremost, or a hedge, or a store I think store of it as a risk hedge. A risk hedge. In every respect. And again, this goes right the way back to ancient usage because you take it with you because it's a portable currency, blah, blah, blah. Now, it's a hedge against risk for people, again, if they need to leave, leave a country or because they're concerned about geopolitical risk in general. That's at the retail level. And then right the way through to professional investment, there's been an awful lot of quantitative work done on it, which shows that against other asset classes, or the vast majority of other asset classes, it either has a very low positive or more likely a negative and on odd occasions a zero correlation. So from a professional investment point of view, it's very good for expanding the efficient frontier, i.e. you raise your reward for the same level of risk or vice versa. So right the way across the whole spectrum, it acts as a hedge against risk. In terms of gold as a currency, you know, how do you how do you view that? Well, what prism do you like to look through when, if people want to talk to you about gold as a currency? I think of it basically, well, most people think of it as a dollar hedge because it's denominated in dollars, obviously. So from a professional investment standpoint, that would have to be how you look at it. From the point of view of looking at it as a currency, we go back to what I was saying before about depending on where you are in the world, if you, if you need to barter, then that's what you would use in an ideal world because people will trust it. And the other, the other one is always the inflation edge. Everyone says it, this yep. is, it, and a lot of people think it's purely and simply an inflation edge. They, they, they look at it and they say it doesn't work as an inflation edge. I mean, That's because there's no inflation. Well, no, which is exactly the <laughs> point I wanted to make. Yeah, I mean, we haven't, we've lived through this era since the gold price peaked in 1980 of essentially falling inflation. It's just fallen for 35 years. And we're now, it's a problem because it's fallen too far, obviously. So I think that idea of gold as an inflation hedge, whilst those people are right, it hasn't really been one because it hasn't had to be. Exactly. You kind of get that sense that if we do, if central bankers are successful in their stated aim of generating 2% inflation, we will see that role for gold return rather quickly, I would think. Are you seeing anything in market dynamics that suggests people are moving into it because they do see inflation coming or are we not quite there yet? Not quite yet. Uh, at the moment, it's it's still Fed watching. It's been Fed watching for donkey's years. And the interest rate cycle has been one of the key elements that's informed analysis over the last two, three years or so. Not so much now, because the uncertainty has fallen away, or very largely. Um, but certainly a couple of years ago, when nobody quite knew how many interest rates hikes to expect in the States, um, that, that was one of the reasons why people were, were, hold, were sitting on their hands with respect to just about everything, to be perfectly honest, not just gold. Well, let's, 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 move, let's get into the supply and demand stuff, because that's what, that's what a lot of what the survey is based around mm -hmm. because obviously they're the, they're the factors that will determine the price ultimately, I guess. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what you found this year when you went through the survey, the interesting points that, that you took out of it, and perhaps the changes you've seen between this year and last, mm -hmm. and then perhaps any that you've seen right. have been evolving over the last sort of five or six years and, and look like they might be the trends to follow as we go forward. One particularly interesting change over the past year or so has been within the balance of jewellery demand and investment demand. Now I'm going to have to come back to this one because it's a two or three pronged argument. Jewellery in the Western Hemisphere is not investment, it's adornment. adornment. Jewellery basically anywhere east of Suez is predominantly investment. Yeah. I'll give you an example. This beauty, um, 
and you the rings I'm wearing. Outfit. You might have to hold that outfit. Whether that's visible. But that, that is bright yellow. And that is four nines, i.e. 24 karat gold, as is the ring. Now, you probably can't see from here, but if you compare that finger with that finger, yeah, it's, it's like that's 18 carat. Yeah. And the dilution there is copper, predominantly. So, quick masterclass on jewellery. Um, Western Europe, predominantly 14 carat. United Kingdom, I'm ashamed to say, generally nine. United States, somewhere between the two. So, if, as somebody in the United Kingdom, you're buying a plain piece of nine carat gold jewellery, you will pay anything between four and six times the intrinsic value of the gold. Right. Because nine carat gold jewellery is over 60% copper and should really be called gold containing jewellery. Yeah. And then you've got wholesale, retail, distribution, VAT, retailer sunk costs, etc., etc., etc. So when you buy that piece of kit, you're never going to be able to sell it back for the value of the contained gold. This, by contrast, and I was actually in Hong Kong last week and one of the links was broken, so I did actually do a spot of scrap trading. Right. Um, you pay by weight with a specific fabrication charge. So when you go into somewhere in Hong Kong or, or anywhere in India, China, any Dubai is Southeast a great Asia, place the yeah, they will have the weight of the piece and they will weigh it for you again just to prove it to you in, in front of you. Then they'll add the fabrication charge and you don't really pay very much over the top at all. So if you want to sell it back, you're going to get pretty much what you paid for it in terms of weight and according to the prevailing gold price. And it's priced on the London previous afternoon LBMA price. So what you see really is what you get. Yeah. It's an incredibly low margin business actually, this, this it whole is. business. Yeah, it is. Um, so jewellery over there, investment, and that's how it works, basically. So. Having said that there's been a big shift between jewellery and investment, I must put that caveat in because maybe 50% of jewellery, probably a little bit more actually, is based on weight as opposed to sticker prices. ETF investment is predominantly professional, but there's a degree of private investment in there as well. So it's not cut and dried between the two, but it is nonetheless interesting that we had a massive drop in jewellery demand last year predominantly because India and China had, for different reasons, very weak years, but a big resurgence in exchange-traded fund investments. So if we actually add the two together, plus bars and coins, what we call our identifiable investment component, plus jewellery, you add those two together, if they combined, they were actually higher last year than they were the year before. It was just there was a big change in, in the product mix, as it were. So what this suggests, is that after three years of selling out of exchange traded funds over 1100 tons over the course of the 13, 14, 15, we had uptake of over 500 tons in ETFs last year, whereas jewellery and bars were down. Now, jewellery and bars were down partly for economic reasons rather than geopolitical, but the ETF investment was coming back, was coming back in because of geopolitical risk as much as anything else. And as you were saying earlier, there is a possibility that people are looking further out because there is a lot of liquidity in the financial system. And once the major economies are in lockstep once again, there is a risk of inflation. So long-term investors will be, will be looking at that. So you said India and China, for different reasons, had bad years. So just expand on that a little bit, if you would. Interesting markets, both of them. Yes. India first. Any self-respecting gold analyst needs to be an amateur meteorologist. And Thomson Reuters, we're lucky because we've got Lanworth, who are a team of agricultural analysts, and they're wonderful. They're mathematicians and physicists and meteorologists. And they have actually forecast the outcome of the Indian monsoon season more accurately for the past four years than the Indian government has. 40% of the Indian population is in the agricultural industry, and about 60% is reliant on it. So that's 40 as a subset of 60, not the total coming to 100 and they don't trust the banking system. So when there is a good harvest and there is disposable income, then that informs the buying from the Indian farmers as far as gold is concerned. And of course, gold has religion significance in India. And when an Indian girl marries, she takes her dowry and that goes to the husband apart from her gold, right. which is her Sridhar, very important part of Indian society. Last year and the year before, the monsoons weren't great. The expectation was for a better one last year. It was all right, but it wasn't wonderful. The expectation for this year is better. 
And the Indian government hadn't raised what they called the minimum support price for, for the crops by, by very much. So there wasn't a lot of money available for Indian purchases. There'd also been some problems with, in 2015, the imposition by the government of what they called the 80-20 rule, which dislocated the market for a while. And what that was all about was that the banks and the star people who were bringing metal in were, were required to ring fence 20% of their imports do something to add value, which was basically simple jewellery fabrication for re-export. And that dislocated the market for a while. And now we are waiting for the general sales tax. So all those different things have meant that Indian demand has been low last year and it, it, it was a bit better the year before, but still on, it's still on a downward path. So what we've got, and this is looking forward if you like, is quite a lot of pent up demand so that as and when things get better and if we have a good monsoon season this year you will probably find that there'll be pre pretty strong buying starting to come back out of India. It's not really there yet though. And what's, what's the cash ban? What, what effect has that had on the gold market? Because a lot of people had presumed that it would either be very bullish or very bearish for the gold demand and it doesn't seem to have had a material effect so far. This is where we turn it from a science into an art. Right. Generally speaking, the underlying physical demand or lack thereof in the price, or sorry, in the, in the metal itself, will be a contributory factor to what's happening to the price, but it will very, very rarely be a sole driver. So that if the price is falling and physical demand starts to come in, it may well help to cushion it. But strong physical demand in and of itself is rarely enough to push a price higher. That's where you start needing the hot money and the, and the professional investors. So that's when you have to start looking at currencies and equity yeah. markets and bonds and so on and so forth. So that's India dealt with, more or less. China, India and China between them take up about 50% of the world's jewellery demand in any one year. China's now the world's largest consumer if you include the industrial use and so forth, whereas India is still very much based on the jewellery, it's got a lower electronic sector. China's issues actually go right the way back to 19... No, they don't, they go back to 2013. Financial crisis, 2008-2009, heavy ETF purchases in the West. Period of relative stability, 2013, perception takes hold that the financial crisis is easing, gold has done its job, so some sales started out of the ETFs. In fact, they hemorrhaged in April particularly, and then also June was strong, but not quite as dramatic as April was. We lost a phenomenal amount of metal coming out of the ETFs. Over the year as a whole, it was 888 tonnes, which compares with about 3,000 tonnes worth of mine production, yeah. to give you a sense of perspective. Arguably, the rate determining step at the speed with which that metal could go east, because that's where it all went, was the capacity of the Swiss refiners, because ETF metal, contrary to some conspiracy theorists, is allocated, and you can get the bar lists, and you can see the numbers, and they're generally London good delivery bars, which are 995. That's not acceptable in the Far East. They want four nines. So the Swiss refiners were working flat out, turning these LGD bars into four nines bars, anything from a gram up to a kilo, basically. And it was going out predominantly into China. And they overbought, deliberately in some cases, because the price was coming plummeting down. So quite a lot of the gold that, it was known as the Chinese aunties, the women who run the families. Uh, they were buying ahead of time. They were buying for 2014 purchases as, as well as 2013. So that automatically pulls the rug from under 2014 a little bit. And the banks were a little bit cheeky. Chinese premier were running higher as against local London, as you might expect, given what was going on. So some of the banks bustled in on this and took metal in with the expectation of capturing the premium. Didn't necessarily work out because demand had been sated. So they were left with a lot of metal on their hands. So that has also helped to undermine what's been going on. So that's 2014 and 2015, essentially. 2015 was made worse by the vagaries of the equities markets. Equities markets plummeting, but people were locked in because prices were moving so quickly. So they couldn't get it out and buy the gold that they would have wanted as a hedge against risk for, for the future. And last year, it's been an economic issue. It's predominantly been jewellery. There, there was actually a slight increase in bars because of concern about the destination of the renminbi. Uh, so we've had a combination of investment, overinvestment, and then the economy slowing down. And on the other side, concerns about the, the yuan. So again, there's, there's signs of a little bit of an uptick, but until the Chinese economy has been stabilized, then that's going to remain under a little bit of pressure as well. You know, this, this, this idea of the gold moving from west to east is, is something that a lot of people talk about 
Um, but again, more from a philosophical standpoint in that they understand that, to your earlier point, there's a, there's a, there's a cultural affinity for gold mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's used in a, in a transactional way and it's also used as gifts for weddings and christenings and all this kind of thing. So when people talk about the gold moving from west to east, it's kind of a big blurry thing that people kind of go, well, but, I mean, can you put some perspective around the kind of flows we're seeing yeah. and what that might mean at a point in time where let's say we have another 08 style event where there is a desire in the West to own gold again like we saw. In the interim, what's, what's that shift of physical metal out to Asia meant in terms of what might happen in terms of quantum if we see that again? Right. The rule of thumb has always been gold will flow from west to east and it won't come back again. Yeah. It did last year. Not a huge amount out of China necessarily, but certainly if we look at South Asia and the Middle East, there's a lovely infographic in the middle of the survey which has got lots and lots of flags in it, and it's Swiss trade. So on the one side you've got the import sources of metal into Switzerland, and on the other side you've got the export destinations. Now in 2015, a lot of the material that was going out of Switzerland was going into countries that genuinely wanted it. But this year, if you look at the sources for imports, one of the biggest flags is Dubai, because material has been coming back to Dubai and they haven't been able to ship it back into India because India hasn't wanted it very much, so it's come back to Switzerland. And if you look at the exports, there's still a reasonable amount going out into China, very little going out into Hong Kong, but masses going back into the UK. So what those two tell us between us last year is that material has been coming back out of some of the traditional consuming regions, coming back into Switzerland for re-refining, from, maybe from jewellery into, um, into bullion, whatever. And a lot of it's come back into London vaults because there's nowhere, nowhere else for it to go. Is that a demand phenomenon? I it's a loss of demand, yeah. It's a loss of demand, it is. A loss of demand in Asia. Correct. And an increase in ETF demand or just that's the natural flow of these things? Up, once up to a point, speaking. yes. And some of it's just sitting in vaults on, on banks' books waiting to be taken off. So, so right now there's no, there's no tightness in the market, there's no the supply and demand equilibrium is, is, is fine. So when, so when you look through that, uh, the report, um, you know, what stands out to you? Because every year I'm sure there are, there are certain data points that you make, oh, okay, this is interesting, there's a shift here. You know, what does it mean? What, what, when you went through the report this year, were the things that jumped out at you? This particular year is the one we've just been talking about, really. Right. Um, but there's also signs that central bank purchasing is on the wane. Going to remain positive, we think, and India and China, sorry, Russia and China are the, the two major purchasers. Um, the stability of the US economy and actually the strength of the dollar means that there's less pressure on some emerging markets. Uh, so there's less risk hedging coming, on, coming in from the central bankers. But we, we still expect them to, to remain on the demand side of the market. The, the days of heavy selling have gone. The Chinese gold market, everyone's got a number in their heads about how much gold the Chinese really own. There's all these conspiracy theories about tens of thousands of tons stacked up in PLA warehouses everywhere and, and you know, they, they hide it and they, they try and obfuscate the truth so no one really knows, but really they've got 25,000 tons instead of six. In your research, what kind of picture can you paint with Chinese official gold holdings? Well, obviously it's a sensitive one. Um, they're not particularly forthcoming. Yeah. The changes that they made over the last 18 months or so have been very helpful in the sense that they're now reporting, or if they were until very recently, yeah. on a monthly basis, what they've done on a net basis, obviously. And we suspect that that was because of the desire to get closer to the IMF and become in involved in the SDR and so on and so forth. So. They're more open than they were. There hasn't been anything reported recently. Whether that means they're not buying any is hard to say because it is perfectly possible to use, to use an LME term, the white lining mechanism, and have, have it in a bonded warehouse but not in the central yeah. bank vaults, for example. Well, I'll just so, explain that to people because there are people that don't understand how that works. It's, well, it's white an lining. important point to make, yeah. Um, LME warehouse, on warrant, off warrant. If something's off warrant, it means that you're, you're ready to take it out of, the, out of the warehouse or you've put it in the warehouse but you haven't yet registered it. So it doesn't show up in the LME warehouse stocks numbers. Once it's on warrant, and it used to be literally moving it across a white line, yeah. I, I don't know whether that's still the same case, but, but it's, it's a term that's stuck. Um, it becomes a, a registered part of the stocks and it shows up in the numbers. 
Right. So, so anyway, so, sorry, I just so, you. we'll get back to so, the Chinese. So it, it is perfectly possible that that's what they're doing. Um, we can't put hand on heart and say we know because we don't, but we, we make as best estimate as we possibly can on the basis of the people that we talk to who are there. What is also interesting, though, and what is becoming an, an improved area of transparency is the Shanghai Gold Exchange. You mentioned conspiracy theorists. There are probably more conspiracy theorists per ounce of gold produced in the world than there are about anything else in the financial sector. Right. Um, but that's a different story. Um, the Shanghai Gold Exchange is very important. Um, it's the only real official channel through which gold can be imported and bought without VAT within the country. But it's not just a repository for imports and a source for producing metal for demand. Things get rolled over time after time. There will be scrap material that comes back. There's material that's come back from jewellers, for example, which, which is sort of in-house scrap, if you like, because they haven't sold it, so they're remelting yeah. to reduce their images and, and this kind of thing. There's also a degree of round tripping going on with Hong Kong, which is all to do with arbitrage against interest rates and so forth. So more often than not, the numbers that the Shanghai Gold Exchange produce for their annual turnover, or their monthly turnover for that matter, are overstating what some people think they mean, because they are not a linear proxy for demand. There's all sorts of things going on. And we have an analyst in Hong Kong who has really gone into the bowels of this. And if anybody wants to read about that in the survey, there's three or four pages on it. He really knows what he's talking about. And he's identified four or five different elements which contribute to SGE turnover. So let's talk about the rise of the Shanghai Exchange, because it's, it's a fairly new phenomenon. And it's very, very quickly become I would argue the most important exchange, perhaps even more so than London now. And some of that is because of the opacity that surrounds it. But when you look at the amount of physical gold that, that does go through that market, it's important. So perhaps you could talk about you know, why it was established and, and what's happened in the sort of three years since it, since it really came online. Well, this is essentially China recognizing its importance in the market and wanting to put some structure around it. Simple as that. And, and, but what is, their, what is their end game? Do they want to become do they want to supersede the LBMA? Is that, is that, do you think that's the goal? Maybe we live in interesting times. Um, yes. there, was, there certainly has been a push, there still is a push, for a local renminbi fixing price. And I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. There's, there's a healthy dynamic between Loco London and Shanghai Gold. It's not a strict arbitrage because Loco London typically is 295 and, and Shanghai Gold is 49s. Yeah. And this actually opens up a whole new story about whether the, the liquidity in the market is becoming fractured because there are too many exchanges competing for business. We can go on to that if you like. Absolutely. Um, to say that they want overall supremacy, I don't know. I'm not inside their heads, but we all know what politicians, can, um, what, what kind of aspirations they have. And certainly I've, I've heard Chinese bankers saying that they, they want this local fix because they are such an important part of the market and presumably they, they think that they should be able to fix against their own benchmark, which is fair enough. Well, this idea of a, of a, a yuan denominated contract is, is also an important and has much wider implications. I mean, we've spoken on this on Real Vision before uh, and, and I've given presentations about this, just this idea that with uh, a controlled currency, there is the makings here of an outlet through a gold contract that is tied up with oil and you can convert renminbi into gold, gold into perhaps dollars, or put gold into oil and then oil into dollars. So there's a way that uh, some dots could be joined that would enable the, uh, the Chinese yuan to become completely internationalized. Absolutely. Is that something that is on people's minds in China or is this Perhaps people like me and, and a friend of mine, Luke Groman, putting dots together that aren't really there yet. It no, I, th I think you're joining the dots, frankly. Uh, there certainly is a push towards international internationalization of the currency. I always struggle with that word as well. I, I don't struggle. Know what it is. I play my teeth. Um, <laughs> and the, the joining of the SDR is an important part towards yes. that. It is possible, actually, going back to what we were saying about central bank purchases or the lack of publication thereof recently, it is possible that this may be part of the management of the yuan in order to prevent too much depreciation? Don't know. The, the numbers involved suggest to me that they're probably too small to, to be of significance, but it, it's a possibility. Well, you, you mentioned that we could, we could expand on this liquidity issue. I, you know, I'd love to explore that a little bit further and just explain mm. what all these exchanges competing, particularly as they are competing for different um, standard delivery forms. What is that doing to liquidity? Be brave. If you go back, <laughs> if you go back three, four years or so ago, Loco London 
was typically 90% of the world's OTC volumes. So Loco London is essentially anything that can be, will be cleared through the London clearing system. It doesn't actually necessarily have to be moved physically, it'll be moved on paper between the, the banks who, who are doing the, the necessary transactions. Shifts in importance of different physical areas in the world, and we're coming back to China predominantly, means that we're now only about 70% of the total OTC. So question, where is that liquidity going? A lot of it's going towards the Far East. But then we've got, as well as the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which is physical, and the, the most active of which is the T plus D contract, which, which is physically deliverable against the others tend to be more rolling contracts. You've got the Shanghai Futures Exchange, which is now turning over very high volumes. And you can arbitrage between Shifi and Comex and London in copper. You should be able to do it between Shifi and Comex in, in gold, really. But you have to make take, take, um, build something in for the 995 against 49s yeah. differential. Then you've got Singapore looking to get in, get, get in on the act. They've certainly got a vault now. Whether they're going to open an exchange is probably up, up for debate. You've got Mumbai, you've got Ahmedabad, you've got all the activity in Dubai and so forth. So there have been questions in that part of the market over the last two or three years as to whether all these new exchanges or new contracts are going to compete against each other with the result that they don't work for the common good. Yeah. Then in London, we've got the OTC market, we've got the ICE and CME and now the LME, which is actually running late, but that's not the LME's fault. Um, due to go live, or the LME is due to go live in August. One of the new contracts, which is the CME, which went live in January, that hasn't yet traded. Um, so the LME has actually been very clever because they've got a commitment to liquidity from the, from the banks that have signed up. It's one of these wanting to be first to be second exercises. Right. Pe people want to see the liquidity in the market before they'll join it, which is, which is always a tough one. So we have to wait and see, basically. So the gold market, I, I want to talk about the size of the gold market because people have an idea, and a lot of people think it's a tiny, tiny market. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly bigger than most people think it is, a lot bigger than most people think it is. So I'd love to get some sense of how big that market is in traded gold versus the actual gold they're pulling out sure. the ground. Yeah. Um, obviously, it is tiny by comparison with treasuries or, or bonds or whatever, but it's very deep. And a lot, a lot of the depth is due to normal buying and selling, but obviously there's going to be forwards and hedging and so on in there. But if you, the, the way to quantify it is to look at the LBMA transfer figures, which is freely available on the LBMA website. You then have to adjust for the fact that those transfer figures are smaller than overall volumes because they don't include material that's been netted off during the day and there's overnight credit to take into account and so on and so forth. So generally speaking, the rule of thumb is that you multiply the LBMA transfers by three, then you adjust for the fact that Loco London is about 70% of global. Right. And when you gross all that up, for last year, we get a number of the order of 19 billion ounces. Um, now a million ounce is, million ounce is a million ounces of 31 tonnes. So 19 billion is about 200,000 tonnes, um, 600,000 tonnes. So it's 200 times mine supply last year. Right, okay. So 200 times the, the amount pulled out of the ground Correct. is traded every year. Yeah. And, and so, so what effect does that have on the price when we do get tightness in, in mine supply? Does it not really matter to that? That's still going to trade anyway? I mean, obviously, premiums and discounts are going to, are going to move around. Yeah. But what, you know, because part of the survey obviously is a big look at the mine supply. And, and we know that over time it's getting harder to get gold out of the ground. It's getting more expensive to pull gold out of the ground. So what are you seeing in the supply side of this dynamic and, and how does that, you think, affect the overall trading? If anything, it's what overall trading does to the mine supply right. as much as anything else. This, this is where we, we, we cross the great divide between the commodity element and the investment sure. currency mm -hmm. element. Last year, actually last year, in fact, um, costs fell a little bit. That was a function of the fact that most production is in non-US denominated currencies, apart from the US, of course, that speaks for itself. So if you take the, the largest 10 producers and put a weighted basket price on, on or weighted basket cost on what they did last year, that actually came down by something like 15% and crude came down by 31%. Yeah. So last year, the 
all in sustaining costs, which includes capital expenditure and so forth, was of the order of 820 ounces, $820 per ounce. And again, in, in the survey, there are cost curves in there comparing last year with the year before and where, where the average price was and so forth. So you can gauge how much of the industry was underwater, which is actually not a huge amount by comparison with platinum, which is really struggling. Yeah. Uh, so what has happened is that the miners, arguably short-sighted in sort of period 11 to 13 when the price was nice and high, rather than bolstering their balance sheets, um, the money went through into dividends or whatever it might have been. And now the prices have come down. Although the margins are still there, they're not big enough for the miners to be able to enter into greenfield or brownfield expenditure. And in some cases, sustaining capital expenditure is under threat as well. So we're actually starting to look at a declining mine profile from here onwards. So that's not going to have too much of an effect on a price, except if you get someone, if you get a big boy like a barrack turning the lights off, then that's going to affect sentiment. So, so supply is, is tight enough that we get, you get one major producer doing that and that causes problems? It would be an effect on sentiment rather than the actual physical right, flows okay. because people might think, whoa, if someone like that has, has got to start tightening their belts, then who else is going to do it? Right. It's actually not really very likely, okay. um, but so, it's, it's, it's what it does to how people feel. So I mean, over the years that you've followed this, uh, you've, you've been involved in this, in this report, which is you know, incredibly thorough, when you, when you look at the miners, uh, you know, they have this reputation of being terrible managers of shareholder capital. Um, you know, some worse than others, and some actually, some of the small ones are actually decent. But ha what changes have you seen in the way, you know, have they learned lessons? Have they not learned lessons? You know, if so, are they ever going to learn lessons? Because there are people out there that want to invest in the mining companies, and they always, you know, the, the management is such a crucial, to me it's the place you start with the mine. I mean, I, I look at the management before we even look at the resource, frankly, to understand that exactly. Dynamic. Location, 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 management, management, management. Yeah, exactly. I have been told, I have not done this research myself, but I have been told by someone who is in a position to know that over the past 10 years, and this is the whole mining sector, not just gold, 50% of the world's CEOs have either stood down or been fired. Right. Apparently. Yeah, that, yeah, that doesn't surprise Allegedly. Um, it's partly a function of the fact that, and I've spoken to many a fund manager in the past who's torn his hair out because as prices have risen, there's been a perceived laxity in management. Now, whether that's actually the case or not, I'm not really in a position to say, because I'm not an equities analyst, but it's certainly the impression that I've formed. Now, we are, the big change actually goes back 18 years. It goes back to 1999, when the Central Bank Gold Agreement was put in place. Mm -hmm. And this was designed to bring some stability to the market, because over the course of the 90s, some central banks in Belgium and the Netherlands were, were particularly involved in this and the Swiss up to a point, and then the UK, which is the government, not the Bank of England. Important, important distinction to make. Um, they were selling into the market and the market was rattled. They, the, there was no sense of confidence as to what was going to happen next. So Central Bank Gold Agreement went into place, putting a maximum quota, not a target, but a quota on a five-year basis as to how much the 15 signatories to the agreement, plus the US and Japan who stood alongside it, would be prepared to sell into the market. That's fine. Price rose, price came down again. But in the small print, not that small print, there was a statement to the effect that they were not going to lend any more gold. Well, that's not quite right. What they said was that they would not allow the amount of lent gold in the market to rise above where it was at the time. Cue a massive short covering rally and, and borrowing activity amongst the specs in particular. And the rate for gold for a day actually hit 40, 40% very briefly. And that put a lot of hedge books under severe stress. Cambio very nearly went under and ended up selling at a loss, selling their gold at a loss, not the company. And Ashanti Gold, which is now Anglo Gold Ashanti, which was responsible for 30% of Ghana's earnings and therefore was too big to fail, she yeah. says, using a banking analogy. Yeah. Um, they had a very complicated hedge book and it took a long time to get it unraveled. So those two were in, in the headlights, if you like, but there were a lot of other mining companies who had complicated hedge books. And the snapshot under FAS 133 for the US reporting sector is what it says it is. It's a snapshot. It's a quarterly position. So a lot of institutional investors were sort of taken aback by this. I think maybe they hadn't realized quite how complicated some hedges were. So there was a huge move thereafter to get the, the, the miners to simplify their hedges mm -hmm. and to be much more transparent.
So that's the most important change that's happened. And I, know, I know it's 17, 18 years ago, but it's still key. And what it does mean is that while you do see some hedging nowadays, and a lot of hedging last year came out of, came out of Australia, um, it's nowhere near as much as it used to be. And sometimes it will be for project finance. In fact, more often than not, it will be because the, the banks want to mitigate their own risk. Sometimes there'll be some opportunistic selling into rallies, which I personally don't regard, regard as a hedge program. I think that's just selling forward. Right. Um, but there are, there are other hedge programs in place, but generally they tend to be relatively simple. Most complicated would be cap and collar through the options, generally speaking. So, so you, you mentioned there about the, the lending, restrictions on lending of gold, and, and, and it's a, that's an important thing I want to come on to because the amount of gold lent in the market and the possible chain reactions, again, we get, we get, you, you can't go anywhere in the gold market without touching on some conspiracy theory or another. You know, it's, just, it's the nature of the beast. And, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the fun of the industry, frankly, chewing all these things over. But you know, there is gold rehypothecated. There is gold that's held on central bank balance sheets as a line item, which is you know, gold lent or, or uh, swapped. I really swapped, yeah, exactly. I should swap in a swap, but the, the, title, chain, the title passes. Yeah, exactly. So, so I wanted to get a sense of that market, because again, you know, if you get an event that a lot of people hold gold for, i.e. some kind of panic, the extent to which there is gold lease and swapped is going to be actually very important in determining how that ripples back through the system. So you know, what's your sense of, of that market, the swap and lease market? Lower than it was, okay. my impression, um, partly because of credit risk. Uh, central bankers now are loath to lend to anything other than AAA, and there aren't very many AAAs around. Yeah. Um, and they've also been lending for shorter tenors. And quite often when their loans have, have matured, they've taken the gold back. So it's a, it's a much thinner market than it used to be. The other element that I've, I said I'd come back to is the specific technical element as to why gold is useful in a portfolio. Now, there, there is the quantitative analysis that we've mentioned already and risk reward and so on and so forth. But one thing that we're often asked as analysts is why when there's a crisis does the gold price fall yeah. because we would expect it to rise? Answer, it's an insurance policy. People buy it in anticipation of a problem or just in, just in case. It's also why people buy on inflationary expectations or accelerating inflation. Inflation just of itself doesn't necessarily do it. But the technical reason is that the execution period for spot trading in gold is T plus two whereas the vast majority of equity markets are T plus three or longer. So if there's a problem, you've got the cash ahead of your margin calls. Yeah, there you go. I, I've never even thought about it like that. So, so, just, so just to finish off, uh, the last thing I want to get onto is a look forward. And you know, I don't want to base this around the price because Good. you and I have spoken about this <laughs> off camera and you know, it's, it's, it's like throwing things at a wall. But you know, what, when, you, when you take away, when you digest uh, the gold survey this year, when you look forward, what do you see as the main driving factors and what do you think that means for supply and demand and by extension price? Do you think the price pressure is liably higher or, or, or potentially lower? We're still looking at geopolitical risk as the yep. key driving factor and there's all sorts of different elements to it. Um, the election of President Trump doesn't necessarily, I'm, I'm not suggesting for a minute that he is a geopolitical risk in and of himself, but... Many, many would disagree with many, you. But, I'm, being, I'm being diplomatic. <laughs> I, I can see that. Um, but there is uncertainty there about the way in which foreign policy is going to be conducted. So that, by definition, means that there is likely to be an, an underlying interest in gold on, on that basis. Then you've got all the other things that are happening in the Middle East, with Syria in particular and so forth. So there's, there's still a bubbling under of political risk there, which is likely to main, keep, keep physical investment demand maintained, both on a, on a retail side and a professional side. Although at the moment, the ETF activity in 2017 is more bullish than what's happening on the ground, basically. That said, we've already talked about the pent-up demand in India and the likely pent-up demand in China, which is probably going to take a few months to come through and which won't be enough to drive the price high, but there'll be enough to put a cushion under it. So if you're looking at a physical market, which is strong enough to keep the, the, the market, if you're looking at physical fundamentals, which are strong enough to keep the market supported, then you start winding in everything else. And on balance, with risk the possibility that the equity markets are, are overvalued and need a correction, although on a forward multiple basis it's arguable that they're not, but there is still some concern about that. And if you're looking at potential currency volatility, then the risk as far as we're concerned is to the upside. And just, just 
just to expand on that a little bit because this, uh, this idea that there are so many risks out there, when we look at North Korea and we look at Trump and we look at Russia and we look at China and we look at all these various things that people are concerned about, the Middle East being you know, key amongst them, a lot of people are sitting there saying, well, why hasn't gold moved? You know, this, these are exactly, to your point, these are exactly the sort of things that traditionally people expect to put a bid under the gold price but it's been incredibly stable for, for some time now. Well, if we go back to the fundamentals again, and the fact that all in sustaining costs for the mining industry is coming in at about 830 odd ounces, or 800 and, 800 and change, and the spot price as we speak is about 1,220, that's a 50% margin. Sure. Now, it's not going to be 50% margin in total because there are other things to be wound in and so on and so forth. But if, if we're talking about copper, say, and we're looking at the average cost of production or the incentive price for new mines to come on stream, then copper wouldn't be trading at 50% higher than the mine production costs. Now, obviously, mine production, as we've already discussed, is only a very small component of supply and gold is very easily mobilized, whether it's scrap return or whether it's central bankers or whether it's distressed sales or whatever it might be. So there's a lot more in the market than just mine, mine supply in and of itself. But it is arguable, given those costs, that if we didn't have all the elements of risk that we're talking about, the price would be $200 lower than it is. Right. Okay, so, so there is a, a, a chance that should all this stuff ease, if President Trump makes friends with Kim Jong-un and the, and the Russians promise to play nice, the, the price pressure could actually be lower if this risk goes away. You're much stronger pressure lower than there is higher, should they yeah. escalate. And we're, we're actually expecting it to meander lower over the next few months and then gradually start to turn around. It's, it's another year of grinding it out, yeah, basically. Yeah. Ronald, it's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun talking to it you. Has, it's been great it's, pleasure. Uh, it's, you don't often get a chance to talk to someone that understands the dynamics of these markets. So well, everyone's got an opinion on the price, yes. but not many people really understand all the facts going to it. So hopefully a lot of people have got a lot out of this. And if it's okay, we'd love to include a link to the report so people absolutely. can download yeah, it and, and sit and pour sure. through the... How many pages was it? It was 90 odd pages? I don't know. It's, it's a lot, but I mean, every, every possible number's in there. And with the, with the ex I have to say that with the exception of proofreading the thing, and I've been a user of this thing since, well, I've, I was contributed to it in 1981-84, and from 84 right the way through to three years ago when I took over running the team, I've been a user of it. And I have never once read the thing from cover to cover. Yeah, well, it's, we it's all a, use it for different reasons. Well, we'll see. We'll the analysts we'll, want the numbers yes. and the local colour and then with the way we've des designed it this year there's overall fabrication and then we've also done areas by country. Fantastic. Uh, so there's all, there's all sorts of different ways of looking well, at it. Well anyone that wants to read it can uh, hopefully pick out the bits they want. I, I reckon there'll be a few people amongst the audience that will read the damn thing from cover to cover. <laughs> Rona, thanks so much for joining us. It's, it's been pleasure. such a pleasure. Thank you.